you know it, you love it, you want it. Is he though? Because um, six foot five, it's shorter than me. All I'm saying, Manuel, Thomas Parr, Thomas Parr, D. Party. That guy. Um, Evening Chelsea fans, welcome back to another week of Chelsea Chat with me, Moose and JD. This week we're going to go through uh, the new fixtures that have been announced for the next season, which is fast approaching on us. Um, so looking at how Chelsea's run of games could be um, and where we think we're going to sort of win or lose the league as part of that. We're then going to go through uh, obviously the transfer tracker, everyone's favourite piece of the week. And then we're going to look into some of the interactive bits that we're going to have in the upcoming season and talk you guys through that. As always, don't forget to subscribe, like the video, comment below. Um, we had some interesting comments last week. We'd love to see more of those, as always. Um, and don't forget to hit the bell notification. So, JB, we're into preparation for next season now. Yeah. Interesting run of games. I think sort of, we dive directly into that. It just got announced for the Premier League. What are your thoughts? Because it's an interesting run. It's sort of... There's yeah. some good, good running games and some not so good. Yeah, when I, when I looked at it, as um, I said to you earlier, I, I tend to look for mm. bad run of fixtures where you have a couple of bad teams kind of all in one. So, like, you, you could be playing Liverpool, Man United um, and Arsenal all, all in the space of three games. And I didn't really see that too much, but um, I think, obviously, May time, right at the very end of the season, we have a good couple of uh of tough fixtures to end the season just before Aston Villa um but uh, to be fair I think before that there isn't much in the way of a really difficult uh run of games so it, yeah it's, it's not too bad I think especially you know we've got um a, an okay opener away at Brighton then you've got Liverpool at home and then we've got a, a, an area where we could probably get a bit of momentum and pick up some points um, just before we go away to Old Trafford. So, yeah, I mean, you know, it's you've got to play every team twice regardless. It's just, I think the important thing is those patches of, of games where where you could have a really easy run or a really bad run. And I think uh, we've managed to kind of escape that mainly. It's just that, that little patch in uh, in May that's going to be difficult. We look at our September, as you mentioned, it's a Brighton away, then a Liverpool at home, and then West Brom away. So, obviously, albeit with Liverpool in the mix there, it gives us an opening day game that I think we can do well at. I think it will be it will be a good test to bring in a Werner, hopefully Havertz, and a number of other players to play against. By no means sort of an easy game, but to sort of come in with a not a massive test in the first game, I think is the honest assessment. Um, I think it'll be a difficult one, but I don't think it's necessarily a challenging one. Um, Liverpool then comes straight after. Um, so we get eased into that Liverpool game, but that's going to be interesting. I mean, fortunate for us, as much as I'm gutted that we didn't win the FA Cup, we're not playing Liverpool twice in two games or three games. And playing them at home always helps. The issue there, obviously, is there's not going to be any fans. So that home advantage probably lessons. I mean, I've got the the fixtures up next next to me here, but the, um, as you say, sort of, I think we can pick up a nice run of form. So after the Liverpool game, we've got West Brom away. We've then got Crystal Palace at home, Southampton at home. And then on the 24th of October, we play United at Old Trafford. This is sort of the second major test. And it really is going to be interesting to see how the new Chelsea squad, because there are going to be some significant changes to our lineup coming forward. It's obviously going to be interesting mm-hmm. to see how well they integrate into the team. Um, they come with a good pedigree in sort of Timo Werner, Havertz, Ziyech. Interesting how he's going to line them up, um, but they're going to have to hit the ground running, is the, the honest assessment. Is that in certain positions that we've invested in, we've not really got a great backup for some of those positions or that we've not had a great run of form for the players who play in that position. So we're going to be leaning heavily on some of those. It's going to be interesting to see how they adapt and then equally what their sort of form is when they sort of walk into the, the club. And we give them a good ease into the squad. I'd sort of say sort of two major tests out of the, the first six is 
a good sort of piece. I think if you look at someone like Arsenal after their first two games, it's pretty yeah. intense. So I, I, I remember looking at it's like a run of five really tough fixtures, I think. Because they've got Fulham, West Ham, Liverpool, Sheffield United, City, Leicester, United. Not envying that at all. Um, so as you say, and then sort of we've got a few other sort of tough games. We've got Tottenham away end of November. Um, then we get into December. We then come into sort of an Everton Wolves Arsenal on Boxing Day, which would be a, a good watch. Um, and then second of Jan, it goes City and then Leicester with sort of 10 days to prepare between those two games. I think sort of where we'd spoken around is our run of games are quite balanced out until the, the week of, well, effectively April and May, where whatever happens as a Chelsea fan, we need to tie up where we are going to be in the, the league by at least May. I think this is where you were looking for those run of sort of bad games and May is where ours happened. So into the, fi- the penultimate games, we have on the 8th of May City away, then Arsenal at home, Leicester at home, and then on the final game of the season, it's Aston Villa away. It's going to be nice for Chilwell, though, to lift the Premier League uh, against his former club at home in the last uh, <laughs> last game of the home game of the season. That'd be nice for him. So I think so we've gone through all of them. We haven't gone line by line, each of our fixtures for the Premier League. But what are your thoughts on how we, we sort of lined up? I mean, from my perspective, it looks pretty good. And compared to sort of other seasons where we've had a congested fixture list in Christmas that just kills you over sort of the, the winter period. Yeah. Um, we always we always struggle over winter. So I think, you know, uh, the winter period is quite tough for us, um, especially, you know, from that Arsenal game. Then you've got the, the next run, which is quite difficult. Um, we've always struggled over that period. So it's going to be even harder um, staying that. Last season, when you got to that winter fixtures, we beat uh, Tottenham twice and we beat Arsenal. So you know we can still do well in that in that time, especially in the big games. We we seem to turn up last year in the big games. So just hopefully we can do that again. There's there's as, as we said, you know, there's uh, quite a few uh, spells in in that run of fixtures where we have the opportunity to get some momentum behind us before we go into some of these big games and and get some good points in the, on the board. And hopefully we can do that. And you know get to a good place before we get to that, you know, the running in May and hopefully notch up some good points before then. Hey, transfer twacker. Transfer-wise, so firstly, we had an announcement of a new young defender, Xavier Mbayama. Um, <laughs> <laughs> of the Xavier. X-Men first class, um, which I can only take as a great thing because he's superhuman. I think you'll find his name is uh, Xavier. To, to me, he looks like a good player. He, um, I think sort of, you were mentioning last week, he was due to sign for us prior to our transfer embargo and has come this summer. Um, 18 years old, looks like an absolute beast of a centre-back, um, six foot five. This term gets bounded around far too often, but sort of people are calling him Van Dijk-esque. Um, yeah, it's because because he's Dutch. I think is the more <laughs> the main reason why he's being called the next Van Dyke. But no, he he looks like a very good player. You know, he's um, he's very good on the ball. Uh, by the way, this is all from what I've heard and from a few highlights clips. I'm not an expert on the guy. It's just what I've heard is that he's he's, he's very good on the ball. Um, he's obviously a massive guy, as you just said. So he's very good in the air. He's very physical, and that's what we've been lacking a lot of. I mean, I don't. It, intend to see him much this season I think he'll be brought on no. for the cup games I think he'll be brought on as a development player so depending yeah, on how good I he is he'll, he'll be prob- yeah he'll be playing in the development team this season I think and if he does like ridiculously well at the start then he might get brought in like Gilmore last year you know he spent the first kind of bit of the time playing for like the under 23s and then he was drafted in when he was doing really well and Lampard trusted in him so I think the same could happen there is the potential that this week we get three with our new sponsor. Three signings that come through. And interesting ones. Three very different signings, but equally three players we definitely need. So the first one, we've probably probably worn out the conversation on this, but Kai Havertz, um, a player that 
almost is wearing a Chelsea top, um, but there are final details to be discussed. Um, so I think he'll be a Chelsea player within the week, if not week after. Um, it, from reading some of the articles, it seems that he's very much down for a tit for tat of when they get paid, how much they get paid, and all of those finer details rather than an if, it's a when, um, yeah. in my eyes. Um, I don't think we need to discuss too much on Kai Alex. I think we've done many. Yeah, I think the only around. thing to raise as well is he pretty much has to be a Chelsea player by this time next week because they, like Leverkusen, have basically t- turned around and said, if it's not done, uh, done by the 28th, it's not happening. You need to have it done before then because that's when the players are due back for training in Germany. So they want it done and dusted by then. We've just returned back to training already. So we kind of, you know, Lampard wants his new boys in. He wants to to get them ready in training. So um, it should be done by this time next week. I think all three, I would imagine, would have signed. Um, I think if we do sign Thiago Silva, um, I think he might take a little bit longer to come and join training considering he's playing in the Champions League final as we speak. So um, I, I can't imagine he'll come straight and join his training, especially at his tender old age. So. I think he might take a little bit longer to join up with the squad. But I do think all three transfers will go through this week. Um, it, it sounds like Chilwell's done. It sounds like everything's done with Chilwell. Um, the only thing potentially is that we're having to either wait for Leicester to secure a replacement or for Emerson to make his, his deal to Inter complete. It's interesting. So you mentioned um, two big signings there. Um, one free which is always mm-hmm. nice to hear considering the amount we spent. Um, so Thiago Silva. So as it currently stands, we're filming the podcast whilst the Champions League final is going on. Although he is at the tender age of 35, um, Thiago Silva playing the Champions League final contract is set to expire with um, PSG and Chelsea going in for him. And I think sort of you mentioned this back a couple of weeks ago before I've seen it in the news. Um, but from my perspective, he was... I think this could be a sort of a master stroke by Lampard and the Chelsea sort of backroom squad because what we've been lacking is maturity. Maturity in the back four um, or back five, wherever we play. It's not the, it's the spring chicken that you're looking for, but yeah. we've got a lot of great talent in Tamori, Zuma, Christiansen. Um, he's just a level head to come in and have maturity, sort of 35 years old, has had great pedigree for the last six, seven seasons in PSG, AC Milan, and it's just sort of what sort of an amazing defender. So I think that's a masterstroke in the fact that we're getting him for free. Um, yeah. His wages won't be as much for a 35-year-old. We'll probably hand him a one-year contract based on his age, and he probably is just going to end his career at Chelsea. Um, or his final few years, but just gives us a maturity, a mature head. I mean, from watching the, the leadership as well, considering, you know, he's been the PSG captain for so long. He's been uh, Brazil captain. He's, he brings that sense of leadership at, in the defence, which we desperately needed. And I think he could just come in and teach, you know, I think, I, I think I mentioned him as a potential, you know, a good few weeks back, um, about when I realised that he was going to be leaving as a free, I thought, you know, as a short-term solution, it's perfect on a free, and it gives us the funds then to concentrate on the other areas that we need to. Until you've got the likes of, uh, as you said, uh, Xavier to, to to come through and and be ready. So, I I, I think it's a, a perfect solution, um, and I'm I'm well up for it. And and, and to your point, I think I think you mentioned this just before the podcast. Lewis Dunks just signed a five-year contract with Brighton, um, and he was never going to set the world on fire if he came to us. No. He was just going to be, I think it's probably downplaying Gary Cahill's impact on Chelsea, but like a Gary Cahill figure, someone who is just going to do a job. And I think sort of that would have been a good signing, but it still would have cost us an arm and a leg for a player that wasn't world-class. Yeah. Um, so to your point, I think it's a good, good signing there. Chilwell was another one that seems seemingly looks like it's going to be on a bit of a merry-go-round to achieve. So that's uh, probably chill world to Chelsea. Yeah, it's, it sounds like it. As I said before, it sounds like it's done. Um, I'm hearing it's 45 million up front with five million in add-ons, which, considering their initial um, valuation was 80 million, you know, to take it down to 50 in total, I think is uh, 
fantastic business by Marina. Um, yeah. Even if you know they're desperate for the cash now, it's it's still very good business. Um, yeah. But yeah, it just, I think it just depends on a couple of things. I do think it will be announced regardless uh, in the next couple of days. Though I think latest Wednesday, I'd imagine it will be uh, announced. His one is less important in terms of coming to join with training as well. Uh, because he's injured so uh, he's got a heel injury at the moment so he's he's not going to even take part in the England games before the season starts so yeah he's going to be uh, missing training f- to start with anyway um, so it's, it's no rush to get him back into training but I do think it'll be early part of this week that I'll announce that one it sounds like it's the closest one to to actually being confirmed by the club. And it looks like an, another target of ours will probably make his way to Leicester as part of that. So it looks like Tegla Fico will probably make his way to Leicester to fill the gap that Chilwell leaves. Um, I think that leaves us, so those are hopefully three big signings we're going to get at the end of this week, uh, or by the end of this week. One of the things that's going to be interesting is the big gap that we haven't filled yet. So the, the, probably the remaining... <laughs> between the sticks, the, the remaining challenge that we have. So we've spoken for a number of games that Kepa's not been up to the mark. He's, he's never sort of really settled at Chelsea. It's an area that we've identified to get rid of. And I think every keeper possible has been linked with us. Um, so for some reason, Onana doesn't seem as good as an option as previously thought. There's something not quite right. I think you mentioned this on last week's podcast. Um, as to why they've not selected to go down that route, because he does seem like a very obvious sort of transfer so. target. Um, but there just seems to be something as to why we're cautious to go for him. There's a few new transfer targets that I've seen come up this week. So there's the Lille goalkeeper, Mike Magnol, um, and then equally um, Edouard Mendy from Rain. To be fair, I know nothing about either, either of them. I, 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 don't, <laughs> I couldn't clear. even tell you how old they are. But, um, yeah. I think both in both cases they would be options to come in and compete with Kepper. I did also hear that Petr Cech's a big fan of Kepper, um, and he believes that he could help him reach his potential. So he's like offered to Lampard and said, "Look, stick with him for another year. I'll come down and help train with him to get him to where he needs to be." just give him another chance. Um, I don't know how true that is. It's something I read on um, on Twitter, which is where I get most of my information these days. It, I wouldn't be surprised because of the the money that was spent on him that they want, you know, the, the higher ups want to give him another year at least to try and like nail down a spot. I mean, the first season, you know, Kepa was pretty good. He made some good saves. He, he didn't set the world on fire, but he, he wasn't terrible. You know, he did a good yeah. job. Second season, not so much, obviously. It was a, a tough season for him last year. He obviously lost his confidence. He struggled very much. I, I, I'm struggling to see how he improves at Chelsea now in the Premier League. Maybe, you know, if maybe Czech can give him some pointers and give him a, a bit of help, then maybe. But I, I don't think he's physically strong enough um, for the Premier League, which is the problem. I, I think you could be right. I mean, as a, a goalkeeper, the Premier League is a a very unforgiving league. I mean, you look at David De Gea, one moment he is the best sort of goalkeeper in the world. He's now been sort of like, how do you get rid of him? And Czech obviously sees him train week in, week out. So he's got talent for Czech to sort of regard him as a good goalkeeper. I think to your point, he needs confidence and you can't be confident if you are the number one goalkeeper and every week you'll put on show and strikers will bite on that. Strikers will go right we'll just give it a go. We'll give it another shot and, and just test him because he's obviously not so confident. Um, we need to bring in another goalkeeper to give him that competition because yeah. players know that Willy Calavero is not, he's not um, a Premier League goalkeeper that you play week in, week out. He's a stopgap solution for a problem. Yeah. Um, and they know he's got a mistake in him. So people are going to test him as well. I'd rather see Willy as a third choice goalkeeper. Um, mm-hmm let him play for the cup games, um, but bring someone else in to do that. I mean, there is plenty of goalkeepers out there. I think it's the one position that is, there is a lot of Options. players. To, yeah, um, I mean, there's sort of, I wouldn't necessarily go for him because I think he's dropped it sort of, in my impressions, massively. But there's the likes of Jack Butler and if you wanted to go for someone cheap in sort of the 10 million range. Yeah. I feel that, 
one of these French goalkeepers would probably be a better option. I'm always averse to buying an English goalkeeper. And I think sort of Matt's comments a few weeks back on the podcast probably cemented that. Mm-hmm. English goalkeepers just get too much focus on them. But, but you know, if, it, if if you look at someone like Pope, he's done it in the Premier League already, you know. He's, for Burnley, though. It, it, you're never really expecting yeah. to hit too big heights with a Burnley. Um, but at the same time, as a goalkeeper, you know, if you're playing for a lower down team and you're doing well, you know, you're facing a hell of a lot more shots than you would if you were in, not necessarily Chelsea, because our defence is not great, but it, you know, hopefully will be better next season. Um, but you, you know, if you've, you're playing for a better team, you'd expect to be facing less shots. Yeah, well, um, um, the only thing I would say against that is you look at sort of Pickford at Everton. He was amazing at Sunderland and, and equally had an amazing World Cup. Seemingly is being tested every week at Everton and has just dropped confidence. People don't see him as a, a viable top choice at England anymore. Um, I think yeah. they're seeing Nick Pope. And I think sort of it's always the, the grass is always greener. Um, mm-hmm. Nick Pope seems to be doing really well. His confidence is high. I think where... What's interesting is where when he gets tested and when there are negative times, where they all stay is that top goalkeeper. That's the real testament of a good goalkeeper. Yeah. So from my perspective, it'd be interesting, I think is the honest thing. It, it's still somewhere we haven't quite put our finger as to what our strategy is. Do we replace? Do we heavily invest? Do we compete? And I, I, my, my thought process is we probably compete. I'm not seeing anything else from the transfer. There's probably a, a number of others we'll, we'll pick up next week, but looking forward to um, other bits and pieces that we've got going on. So um, we're going to start our, well, we already have started our um, fancy, fancy family. football. Um, you'll see my squads absolutely ruin each other, sort of Jamie's this season. Um, hmm, so it uh, would be good to see more of the, the followers and the listeners of the podcast join in on that. Um, Jamie, what are the deets? What's what's the deets? Uh, I'll post them down in the description below. Um, just click on the link, create a team. Uh, it'll be on the the Premier League website, so um, most people should know the rules for that one already. If not, just read them on the website. Um, but yeah, we'll uh, we'll announce the winners each uh, each month on our on our podcast. So make sure to listen in, and uh, you might hear your name. Mine a lot. Never. <laughs> um, and then what we're going to look forward to is obviously next week um, we're going to have a bit of a change of um, lineup. Um, we'll give more details later in the week um, rather than announce that now. But next week you'll be without Moose um, to be left in the very capable hands of JB. Um, so look forward to listening to that whilst I'm on only. We'll obviously give you some more updates as we go along throughout the week around some of the transfer talk. Any news coming through? Um, obviously the interesting one this week was Harry Maguire being sent to prison. And then, um, yeah, don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell notification and comment below um, on your thoughts around this year's fixture list and transfers. Um, so it'd be great to hear your thoughts. You stay classy, Chelsea fans. Thank you.